and thanks for joining me. This is an introductory presentation on building your personal fortress using the contractual business trust. This is Mark Emery with the Lighthouse Law Club and this is basically an introduction to total privacy. Included in that we could add asset protection, business management, and so many other descriptive terms which we'll get to, but this is an extremely, extremely powerful tool, and I think by the time we get finished with this uh, presentation, you'll see exactly why. So let's get right into it. Welcome to the world of private business trusts. Because of its flexibility, this type of organization takes on the form of a trust, but it is actually something quite different, and I'm going to show you what that is. But it can be used for a number of different purposes. You can manage a business. You could set one up to handle a single transaction that might be important. You could have one to manage one or several financial investments. It could be used to facilitate your financial management for the rest of your life. That's enough in itself. You can use it to protect assets. It's available to preserve family wealth without the need of a will. If you don't know already, probate court is the biggest racket for thieves that exists in the legal world. I'm not going to get into that, but you need to be aware of it. Preserving family wealth, this is an excellent tool. This will ensure continuity of a family business in the event that the principal passes away or becomes incapacitated. There's no need for transfer. There's no need for fighting over who gets what or how it's going to be managed. It maintains absolute continuity without missing a heartbeat when it's in this kind of a vehicle. You can use this for philanthropic desires that you may have to donate to charities, setting up funds to be dealt with automatically. And this will negate forced airship laws. Again, you may have a will which could be contested by debates over the law which has certain requirements that or certain people must be included in the will when that may not be your desire at all. So that can be a big issue. And this vehicle can be used to create a pension scheme for your employees to make sure they're taken care of long term. Or do the same for your dependents, your family. Or you could use this in addition to everything above to minimize or avoid many business expenses such as tax liability. <laughs> it's funny how that one always seems to sneak in there, isn't it? Okay, so as you can see, this is a very useful vehicle. It's very flexible, can be used virtually for any legitimate or lawful purpose, and uh, it's kind of a one-size-fits-all type of entity. So let's take a look at the secret trusts of the super rich. I pulled out here an excerpt from the Rockefeller file. That's a book written by Gary Allen. I think it was back in 1970. And uh, in fact, it's available on the internet. You can find it and download it for yourself. But let's, let's look at this quote. He says, all trusts are not equal. Only a handful of attorneys in the country knows how to establish the type of trusts the Rockefellers have. These special trusts are most emphatically not the sort your friendly local attorney can create for you. They not only eliminate probate, but inheritance taxes and reduce your income taxes. Unlike corporations, they can achieve almost total privacy. Theoretically, Trustees can, within the privacy of their director's meetings, create more and more trusts ad infinitum. With a little effort, taxes disappear. With more effort, even the value of the holdings can be completely hidden. 
This explains why the Rockefellers use so many trusts. The fact is, we don't know how many trusts that the family has established. It may be thousands or tens of thousands. Remember Nelson's explanation for the embarrassing fact that he did not pay any income tax in 1970? Well, that was some time ago, so I'm sure not all of us remember that, but his trust managers had done a lot of shifting of investments in 1969. You can bet that they moved their assets to accomplish this. Now, that's saying quite a bit right there. Makes us curious, doesn't it? What trusts are not equal? What are they referring to? What kind of trusts are they using? And if the Rockefellers are using this, who else is? I'll answer those questions here. All right, let's first take a look at what actually is a trust by looking at the definitions. Number one, a trust is one of several juridical devices whereby one person is enabled to deal with the property for the benefit of another person. Okay, that's simple enough. A right of property, real or personal, held by one party for the benefit of another. Okay, simple and straightforward. That's from the restatement of the law of trusts, which is essentially adopted as the statutory code for each and every state. So that's pretty universal. Second definition, a living trust agreement is not an organization. It is, in fact, an agency where the owner of value delivers them to the agent for the purpose of complying with the agreement. Possession changes hands, ownership does not. Where the owner of things of value delivers them to an agent, the agent becomes a bailee to carry out the terms of the agreement. That comes from the key to family security, which was an integral writing on this subject by Harry Morgan Phipps, who uh, had done a tremendous amount of work in putting together his research and findings on this very subject. He was a, an attorney dealing with some very wealthy individuals. And so uh, if you can get your hands on that publication, I had it for some time, but I don't anymore, sadly. But anyway, we can see a living trust is a little bit different uh, definition than the first ones we had, right? Okay, let's continue along this line. When you hear the term trust, you should immediately identify this term with a statutory agreement of trust, all right? So what it's saying is when you hear the term trust, bells ought to go off, just think ding, 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 all right, statutory agreement, civil code, state statutes. That's the jurisdiction, all right, and the regulation. The second point, a unilateral agreement of trust between grantors as opposed to a contract of trust, which is established in accordance with the various state statutes and is therefore subject to subsequent legislation, okay? So what they're saying here is that a civil law statutory trust is a unilateral agreement one person acting on his own. Could be one or more grantors. That's why they, the grantors is plural. Could be one or more. Typically, it's one in most cases. So this is a unilateral agreement of trust as opposed to a contract. A contract cannot be unilateral, can it? It must have at least two parties. All right, so they're making the distinction here between the two. That comes from the First America Research. So continuing, let's take a look at the IRS definition on ordinary trusts. In general, the term trust, as used in the Internal Revenue Code, refers to an arrangement created by a will or by an inter vivos declaration, whereby trustees take title to property for the purpose of protecting or conserving it for the beneficiaries under the ordinary rules applied in chancery or probate courts. Usually the beneficiaries of such a trust do no more than accept the benefits thereof and are not the voluntary planners or creators of the trust arrangement. However, the beneficiaries of such a trust may be the persons who create it and it will be recognized as a trust 
under the Internal Revenue Code if it was created for the purpose of protecting or conserving the trust property for the beneficiaries who still stand in the same relation to the trust as they would if the trust had been created by others for them. Generally speaking, an arrangement is to vest in the trustees responsibility for the protection and conservation of property for the beneficiaries who cannot share in the discharge of responsibility and therefore are not associates in a joint enterprise for the conduct of business for profit. Okay, we've just said quite a mouthful there. A couple of things we can take out of this. They're talking about how the beneficiaries of the trust may be the persons who created it and it would still be recognized as a trust if the trust was still held for the purpose of protecting and conserving the assets. And they would do that if they still stand and set the same relation to the trust as they would if the trust had been created by others for them. So they're saying they could be involved in the creation or others can, can be responsible for creating the trust and will still treat it as a trust provided as their relationship to the assets are the same. Okay, now we can get a real strong clue from the last line of this definition. Okay, they're talking about, let's just read that again. Generally speaking, an arrangement is to vest in trustees responsibility for the protection and conservation of property for the beneficiaries. Okay, got it. That's simple. Those beneficiaries cannot share in the discharge of responsibility. They are simply passive. All they can do is receive. They're not active, right? Therefore, they are not associates in a joint enterprise, i.e. a closely held corporation, where all the partners are working together, for the conduct of business for profit. Okay? So, what they're telling us here is that their, the Internal Revenue Code definition of a trust does not include one whereby there would be associates in a joint enterprise for the conduct of business for a profit. All right, so that's an exception. They're telling us this is an exception to their definition of ordinary trusts. So that's our first clue. So let's take another look at that a little bit further on. Let's look at business trusts. So associates in involved in a joint action with joint interests could very well be considered a business trust. And here the IRS says, the fact that any organization is technically cast in the trust form by conveying title to property to trustees for the benefit of persons designated as beneficiaries will not change the real character of the organization if the organization is more properly classified as a business entity. So what are they saying here? They're saying that someone could present an entity that looks like a trust, that's set up like a trust, that's in the form of a trust, but if the relationships to the assets do not change and the substance of that entity has the characteristics of some other type of business entity, they would classify it as the business entity. So in other words, form does not trump substance. If it looks like a trust, doesn't mean it's a trust. They're gonna look through that and look at the substance of the relationships to the assets and the activity of the persons involved, okay? So substance must match the form. All right, now talking about business entities, there are four types of taxable business entities, corporations, partnerships, associations, and trusts. And that's what the IRS deals with, okay, as business entities. The other entity that they deal with for taxation purposes is the individual, right? But the individual is not a business entity. We're talking about business entities here, okay? So, the takeaway from this is that um, they're going to classify whatever organization you have as some type of a business entity. If it has the characteristics of a business entity, for example, a corporation or a partnership, even though it looks like a trust. 
they're going to bust right through that form of trust and they're going to treat it and tax it as a business entity. Okay, so that's what they're saying on business trusts. So there's a word to the wise right there just to be aware of that and be careful on how things are set up. Make sure it's done properly. So let's look at corporate characteristics. All right, if the Internal Revenue Service is going to look at the substance and determine what classification an entity should be treated as, then we need to know what those characteristics are. So the corporate double tax will apply when you have number one, associates, and number two, joint business interests, and three of the next four characteristics. Limited liability. In a corporation, you have limited liability. You can only lose what's in the corporation. They won't go beyond what the corporation owns. They won't go into your personal accounts, all right? Free transferability of interests. In corporation, you have stock, which you can sell. It's freely transferable, okay? Continuity of life. Corporations exist in perpetuity, so they have continuity of life. And centralized management. Centralized management is a CEO or a board of directors working with a small number of people, working on behalf of a large number of shareholders. That's centralized management, okay? So whatever entity you have is going to be considered and treated as a corporation if it has associates with the joint business interests and any three of the next four characteristics. It doesn't need to have all, all four, uh, but it needs three of those plus the first two. And you're a corporation, okay? So that should be simple enough. Let's create the ordinary trust. What does that actually look like? It's real simple. You've got a grantor. You've got a dad who wants to put some money into a trust and let it grow and keep that separate and apart and safe uh, for college for his uh, son and daughter. Okay? Uh, he's the grantor. He gives that to a trustee with specific instructions. Those are the terms of the trust, the trust document, saying, you will manage this according to these guidelines and once my oldest reaches the age of 18 and graduates from high school you will use so much of this for their first year of school okay so the trustee is the bailey who takes legal ownership legal title to the assets to hold and to manage on behalf of the trustees who have equitable ownership of the assets or equitable interest okay and of course the beneficiaries do nothing. They simply are passive and they receive the benefit at the appropriate time when the conditions are met for the trust. So that's a simple ordinary trust. Easy. Here are some key characteristics of the statutory grantor trust. First of all, the word grantor, the root is grant. That's a gift. Okay. There's no exchange. It's just a gift or a donation into the trust. The grantor receives nothing back. The trustee has conditional use of those assets according to the terms of the trust, but he does not own them. All right? So there's split title. We have legal versus equitable ownership. The beneficiaries are not associated in a joint enterprise. They're not involved or engaged or have any discretion over the assets. They're simply passive and they receive the grant having done nothing. So a statutory or grant or trust derives its existence from the statutory code and thus it's a creature of the state under the control of the state, under the full jurisdiction and authority of the state. So the, the state can essentially do whatever it wants with that which it created. You created this under the franchise extended to you by virtue of the statutory legislation. So let's just uh, review split title. Legal title is use and control of the asset. Equitable title is the actual beneficial ownership. And we can see how this works every day and how your mortgage works. Okay, your mortgaged home is a perfect example. You are the legal owner, your name is on it, you have use of it, but who's the real owner? The bank. And if you don't follow the terms of your contract with the bank, the real owner comes in, 
kicks you out and takes back his property. That's another story <laughs> of fraud we won't get into now. So that's split title, just so you understand. And this is important to understand as it relates to the trust assets. All right, in a statutory trust, we're dealing with split title. The trustee has legal ownership, the beneficiaries have equitable title, okay? Now, a revocable trust, it's important to know what this is about, is one where the control always remains with the grantor. In other words, he can put assets into the trust and he can change his mind and take them back out of the trust. Or he can collapse the trust or, you know, he has control. Trust assets, in this case, are treated by the tax authorities as the grantor's assets. He never alienates himself from those assets. As a result, the assets are taxed just like they're his assets and they can be attached or leaned or seized or done with whatever the authorities want because he never really alienates those assets from his use and control. All right, so the person with the control is the one with the responsibility. And that's an essential element to understand because if you want to reduce your liability on things, lawsuits, taxes, problems, headaches, you need to find a way to give up control and with it goes the liability. Whereas you do not necessarily need to give up the use and enjoyment. So let's compare a trust versus a corporation just to identify some key differences. In a trust, you've got a creator. In a corporation, you have an incorporator. In a trust, you've got a grantor or an investor. In the corporation, you have the investor. The trust has beneficiaries or certificate unit holders, whereas the corporation has stockholders. And where the trust is governed or managed by trustees, the corporation is managed by a board of directors. Okay, so similar functions, but differentiation in terms. It's just important to see that so that we can properly identify trusts and what their key functions are. The key difference between a trust versus a corporation is that in a corporation you have associates working together in a joint business enterprise. That keeps coming up. That's joint action and beneficial interests. When you see those two things together, you should be thinking associates. And this is a corporate characteristic, okay? Having associates is a key corporate characteristic and with that, any entity with associates will be identified as a corporation and it'll be taxed as a corporation. The beneficiaries of a trust, however, are passive. They're not involved in the management or activity and usually have no beneficial interest in most arrangements. Okay? So those are some key differences that you need to be able to distinguish. Now, let's look at a contract. A contract is a meeting of the minds. And that includes two or more parties. There needs to be offer and acceptance of terms supported by lawful consideration. You have those three elements and you got yourself a contract. Could be written, could be verbal. Now let's compare a trust versus a contract. In a trust, a civil law trust, you have a gift. In a contract, you have an exchange. I'm going to pay you $100 and I want 32 cartons of eggs. <laughs> okay, there's an exchange of value for value there. In a trust, you've got unilateral action by the grantor. In a contract, you've got mutual agreement of the parties. Okay, unilateral versus mutual, key there. In a trust, you have gifts involved, which are subject to gift, estate, and inheritance, or possibly income taxes. Versus in a contract, you've got the quid pro quo exchange of value for value or value for lawful consideration. So in a trust, 
You've got beneficiaries who take no part in the activity. They simply sit passively to receive. Versus in a contract, you've got fully active participation by the parties involved. So with that, let's take a look at a different animal. This is not a trust. It's not a corporation. It starts to get a little bit interesting. It's a contractual business organization. What it really is, it's a business organization set up by contract. And it's known by other names. It's known as a collado, common law trust organization, business trust, unincorporated business organization, UBO. It's been called the Massachusetts Trust. Some people call it a blind trust. Others call it a peer trust. Um, it goes by many names. Okay. Personally, I like to use contractual business organization because that is most descriptive and is really reflective of the true essence of what it is. Okay. To most people, you know, you can mention blind trust. Well, most people don't know what a true trust is. What's blind trust? Uh, contractual business organization. Short and sweet gets right to the point. Now, some trusts are subject, are others exempt? Let's take a look at this. You hear a lot of the naysayers saying all kinds of nasty things, but you know what? I'm going to give you the proof right here. In the restatement of the law of trusts, remember, this was what the states have adopted as their civil statutory code. In all the states, concerning the ordinary trust, they discuss matters excluded what they're referring to here is, okay, we're going to talk about all this trust stuff, and this is our law on trusts. And then they say, manners excluded. In other words, these are the things not included or subject to the civil statutory code that we've just adopted and explained or described. So let's read it. A statement of the rules of law relating to the employment of a trust as a device for carrying on business is not within the scope of the restatement of this subject. Well, what did they just say there? A trust that's used as a device for carrying on business is not within the scope. In other words, is not included, is not subject to the civil statutory code on trusts. Done. Case closed. Although many of the rules applicable to trusts are applied to business trusts, yet many of the rules are not applied, and there are other rules which are applicable only to business trusts. <laughs> if that doesn't confuse you, the business trust is a special kind of business association and can best be dealt with in connection with other business associations. Okay. So what they're saying here is a business trust may be dealt with in other ways, which we're not really going to define, but for sure they're not dealt with in our civil statutory code. That's what it's telling us. Okay. There's a little bit of sleight of hand going on here saying that in that last line, oh, this is a special kind of business association can best be dealt with in connection with other business associations kind of making you think that, yeah, well, it's probably dealt with somewhere else in other, other parts of the law in revenue codes. You know, it's, um, that's the inference they want you to have. That's only proof number one. Okay, let's continue. Maybe that's not enough for you. Let's look at proof number two. A contract business organization has vested trustees with full legal and equitable title. That's fee simple ownership. Okay, no split title. Fee simple ownership to the assets of the organization and the beneficiaries only share in a claim on distributions which are contingent upon the trustees declaring a distribution in the first place. Now this is critical. We've got to understand this. In the contract business organization, and we haven't really explained this yet, but the certificate unit holders as so-called beneficiaries do not have a claim on the assets. 
They do not have a claim on the trust. They do not have a joint interest in the assets of the trust. All they have, by virtue of the agreement, is a claim on distributions if and when a trustee declares a distribution. In other words, the certificate unit holder, aka beneficiary, really has no claim whatsoever, other than if the trustee makes a distribution, he gets his fair share. That's it. And that's essential when it comes to asset management, asset protection, legal liability, and all kinds of things. And uh, we'll get more into that uh, critical element in the advanced training, which we're not doing here tonight. We're trying to give you an introduction to some concepts here so you understand the power of what we're dealing with. So therefore, certificate unit holders are not associates in a joint enterprise. No corporate characteristics here, right? No corporate characteristic. The splitting of legal and equitable interest is absent. We have fee simple ownership here. The trustee owns the assets outright. All right. That splitting of title is absent in the contract business organization. And that emphatically means it is not a trust, a civil law trust no split title. There is no consideration in a trust for the performance of services by the creator or the trustees as there is in a contract. So the consideration makes it clear that we're dealing with the contract and not with a trust agreement. Okay? Let's continue. Let's look at internal revenue regulations. Section 301.7701, 4B. Paragraph B on business trust states that there are other arrangements known as trusts because the legal title to property is conveyed to trustees for the benefit of beneficiaries, but which are not classified as trusts for purposes of the Internal Revenue Code because they are not simply arrangements to protect and conserve the property for the beneficiaries. Wow, that's interesting. So they haven't told us what arrangements they are, but they're not simply arrangements to protect and conserve the property. So what the IRS is telling us is that there are arrangements known as trusts, but which are not classified as trusts for the purposes of tax collection because they are not simply arrangements to protect and conserve property for the beneficiaries. Sounds like they're referring to a business trust, doesn't it? Okay. Let me give an example of this in the state code that I pulled out. If we go to the Colorado Revised Statutes, Defining trusts in their probate code, which is where you find the, the trust code is in their probate section, which is Title 15 of the Colorado Revised Statutes, uh, Section 10, Paragraph 201, to which the body of statutory law applies. Okay, in other words, this is the section where they're explaining in the beginning of this whole body of trust law in the probate code, they're explaining how and to whom this law applies. Okay, this is the jurisdictional clause. And they will tell us that this body of law excludes business trusts providing for certificates to be issued to beneficiaries. Wow! That is a red-hot clue. We've been talking about business trusts. We've been talking about exclusions. We've been talking about uh, substance and form and the nature of relationships, which often lead to corporate characteristics. Now we're talking about the certain business trusts that provide for certificates to be issued, not just a declaration in the trust document itself, but now we're talking about another type of trust 
which provides for certificates to be issued to the beneficiaries. And this is totally excluded from the civil law state code. Wow. Let's continue. <laughs> You're going to love this. There was a time back in, uh, I believe it was 1970, presidential election, Nelson Rockefeller was nominated or running as the vice presidential candidate. And of course, you know that uh, presidential candidates have to make certain uh, financial disclosures. They need to file their financial statements, net worth and so forth, make all kinds of disclosures. And the Senate subcommittee that reviews those things will uh, go over that, look for any uh, inconsistencies, clarify those, and just make sure that things are in order for this person to run for public office. Okay, so here's Nelson Rockefeller sitting before the Senate subcommittee reviewing his finances. He submitted his financial statements and the Senate subcommittee reviewed those financial statements and here's what they had to say. Get a load of this. The Senate subcommittee is quoted, quote, due to the complexity and lack of legal means necessary under law to secure in-depth records of the Rockefeller estate, nor having the powers to abridge the right of contract, we must assume that the $218 million figure that he submitted is accurate. <laughs> wow. Let's take a look at this. I want to make sure this sinks into you. All right. First off, remember that quote from uh, Gary Allen on the Rockefeller files? files? He, 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 we talked about just a few minutes ago, talking about how the trustees could, could in their own private uh, meetings, create as many trusts as they wanted to create privately and that would be nobody's business but their own so what does the senate subcommittee say well due to the complexity <laughs> how many tens of thousands of uh, of trust entities did they have set up who knows nobody knows but we know it was complex we know that's for sure because that's what the senate subcommittee told us all right, and then they tell us, due to the lack of legal means necessary under law to secure in-depth records. Now, what are they telling us here? This Senate subcommittee, made up of powerful senators for the United States of America, did not have the legal means to demand and require the production of certain records. Why? because the senators in the subcommittee work for a corporate fiction that operates under statutory law. And what Rockefeller had was not created by virtue of that statutory law. Those entities were not under the jurisdiction. They were not created by the creator, and thus the creator has no authority over that which he doesn't create himself. Do you see how important that is? They've just confirmed the power of the privacy of these entities. Now, lastly, they say, nor do we have the powers to abridge the right of contract. So what's that telling us? That's telling us that these private trusts had clauses, more than likely privacy clauses, that prevented any signatories to the contract from disclosing any information in the contract. There's a privacy clause in the contract and the Congress does not have the power to abridge the right of contract. That's right in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 10. Nobody has the power to abridge the rights of contract. Okay, I hope I've driven that point home. So the only thing they could do was just take his word that the figure that he submitted must be accurate and, you know, we got to move on because uh, there's nothing we can do about this. Now, if that doesn't tell you something, nothing will, okay? So let's go on. I told you about Gary Allen and the Rockefeller file. You can download that, do a search, you'll find it. Interesting, very interesting.
What other companies would use such an entity as their vehicle for doing business? Well, here's one. The Standard Oil Trust was involved in a case, Rice versus Rockefeller. Someone sued Rockefeller and they were going after the Standard Oil Trust. 134 New York, 174. And then you got uh, a site in the Northeast Reporter and so forth. You can look those cases up, read them yourself. The Standard Oil Trust, I would venture to say, was one of those complex contracts that the Senate subcommittee did not have the rights to abrogate uh, the rights to privacy and the rights to contract. You can also look up business trusts in 13 Amjur, second edition, American Jurisprudence is a uh, legal encyclopedia, Corpus Juris Secundum is a different brand name for another encyclopedia, legal encyclopedia, 88 American Law Reports, third edition, page 704, 156 American Law Review, an exhaustive treatise on business trusts. Look up the U.S. Supreme Court decision, Lee, Navarro versus Lee, where they restated the major cases of law in 1980. These are major cases of law supporting this entity, its rights, and, and privacy provisions. Very important case. And there are others, many others. Okay. So we know it's a strong vehicle. We know it's recognized. It's recognized in the law. It's protected by the law. It's provided for by the law. Trusts are globally accepted and recognized by treaty. There was a multilateral convention on the law applicable to trusts and on their recognition. That was concluded in The Hague, the International Court, in 1985. Okay, so this is a contract business organization is a contract which takes the form of a trust. And so it's quite often presented as a trust. However, the substance is much different when someone really starts to look into it. So we, we talk about it loosely as a trust and being accepted as a trust when in fact we know it's much more than a trust. Okay. Now, what about fraudulent trusts? You hear about people getting into trouble all the time? Not all the time, but it happens frequently where people just screw up. And this is how it happens. Number one, if you have intent to defraud creditors with a fraudulent transfer, you're going to get nailed. That's not what a trust is for. Let's say someone, says you, someone sends you a notice that you owe them money or they have a claim that they want to establish that you owe them money. You've been put on notice, and now that you have that notice, you willfully transfer those assets out of harm's way. That's a fraudulent transfer, and it will be nullified. It'll be stricken. Those assets will be treated as your own, and they'll be brought back and dealt with according to the law. All right. Another way people get messed up is the grantor sets up an alter ego, which is a sham. And yet, the grantor still retains full control, use, and enjoyment of the assets, yet he tries to shield himself from taxes and other liabilities while his basic relationship to the assets has not really changed in any way. So he'll be standing there in front of the judge, and the judge will basically say, okay, so before this transfer, you had full use, access, control, and enjoyment of these assets. Okay, now, after the transfer, we see that you still had full use, control, benefit, and enjoyment of the assets, so your relationship really has not changed. This transaction is a sham. This trust is really just you, isn't it? And it is. It's a sham, and it'll be stricken. All right, and that's how people get into a little bit of trouble. You, You've got to understand some of the finer points about changing your relationship to the assets. Okay, there's just no doubt about it. There is a multilateral convention on the law applicable to trusts, and the states that are signatory to the present convention, considering that the trust, as developed in the courts of equity, in the common law jurisdictions, 
and adopted with some modifications in other jurisdictions is a unique legal institution. So don't let anybody tell you that a trust or this type of trust is not recognized. And again, this is multilateral, global. Okay? We're operating in maritime law under admiralty, the law of commerce, the law of the high seas, and this is how the entire world operates. It's simple. Speaking of that, since we are in the high seas, let's talk about admiralty law and the law of the flag. This becomes quite interesting. Under admiralty, the ship's flag determines the source of law imposed upon the vessel. So if you're on the high seas and um, you see a ship of Liberian registry flying the Liberian flag, if for any reason you board that ship, you know that you are subject to the laws of Liberia. That captain is fully empowered to enforce the laws of Liberia upon his ship. That's the law of the flag. Admiralty law or maritime law is the distinct body of law, both substantive and procedural, governing navigation and shipping. Topics associated with this field in legal reference works may include shipping, navigation, waters, and what? Commerce. And since everything is commerce, everything is under admiralty. So let's not fight it, let's just use it. I saw an aerial photo of a federal court building in Florida and it was unmistakable that on the roof of this federal court building there was a barrier wall built up in the shape of a hull of a ship. It was unmistakable. It wasn't maybe or it kind of looked like it. No. It was the hull of a ship. You enter into that federal court building, you are under the law of the flag, which is gold fringed, admiralty law, you are on the high seas, the judge is the captain of the ship, and you are subject to that law. That's how it works. Okay? Today, you don't have any du jour or at law courts available, at least on a widespread basis, to protect your rights. Under admiralty, you don't have any rights. You only have the contract. What's in the contract? The contract is the vessel. Everyone is a vessel in commerce. You are a vessel in commerce. You are carrying cargo. You have value. You are ex making exchanges, conducting commerce on a daily basis. So your benefits and obligations are, are adjudicated as per the contract and not your rights. So don't go into court claiming your rights because you're not, you don't have any rights. You're an admiralty court. You need to produce the contract. Where's the contract that stipulates what your benefits and obligations are? Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to use admiralty law. Take a look at Anguilla. Anguilla is a little island in the Caribbean they have a new trust ordinance. Very progressive, very interesting. This is the flag of Anguilla. And in this instance, our vessel is floating upon the waters of international commerce. Our vessel is the contract. Let's just say we put the, the Anguilla flag as the masthead on our contract our contractual business organization. And we make a notation that the, we are now subject to the laws of Anguilla, but these are only for reference, governing the contract. They are not the source of existence. The contract or the entity or the vehicle did not come into being by virtue of those laws, but those laws are merely for reference and for governing purposes, okay? 
The trust ordinance provides some very flexible management, extremely flexible. In other words, you can do pretty much anything you want to do, provided it's not illegal or immoral. It was going to hurt anybody. <laughs> extremely flexible. It recognizes variant trusts and these are like special purpose trusts or trusts that look different or act different, uh, have different purposes, different characteristics. Okay, so you can have all kinds of different types of trusts under the Anguilla Trust Ordinance and the Anguilla Courts will not recognize the validity of any claim from any other court or jurisdiction. That's interesting. You know how members of the G20 states, they all work together, help each other, stealing from their people, sharing information, enforcing each other's draconian regulations. Anguilla Courts don't do that, okay? You understand that. The trust ordinance provides for flight provisions. I'm not talking about airlines. <laughs> I'm talking about that if for any reason there should be undue pressure, which would be perceived as a threat to the vehicle, that the parties involved would be empowered to move the domicile of that vehicle to another venue. Okay, that's helpful. And you can look these things up for yourself at this link, Anguilla FSC Financial Services Commission dot com and slash da da da. There you go. So that presents some interesting uh, concepts. The venue, whether that's Anguilla or if you want the Republic of the United States of America or any other venue in the world. That's determined by a bargain of the parties, in fact, the people involved in the contract. That's by agreement. So those parties can decide what venue they want to govern the contract. Any contract has uh, dispute clauses for resolution of disputes and governing law clauses. You know, often one party or the other will demand that the governing law is the law in the jurisdiction where they are domiciled just makes it easier. They don't want to have to go around the world to you know, negotiate a dispute. So that law can be negotiated, governing law and resolution of disputes. Typically in many business cases can be done by binding arbitration by mutual agreement of the parties and they name an arbitrator. Okay, These are all subject to whatever the parties involved want to put into the contract. So this establishes jurisdiction by agreement. And what that means is that jurisdiction cannot be superseded by meddling interlopers. And I don't think I need to name names, do I? <laughs> okay, enough said on that. The detractors to this type of entity, this is so powerful, so effective, so private, so out of reach, so out of their jurisdiction, so untouchable that the people that benefit from the system, advisors, counselors, accountants, lawyers, officials, to a man, will tell you, ah, oh, you're going to jail if you use these things. These things are no good. They're bogus. Why? First of all, they can't argue the law because the law is clear. It's crystal clear. They can't argue the facts. The facts are black and white. They're laid out in the contract. So if you can't argue the law, you can't argue the facts, you can't get statutory code to stick. Why? Because it's not a statutory creature. It's not created by franchise of the statutory legislative codes. So they can't get that to stick. They can't throw that against you. They can't get jurisdiction because by the bargain of the parties, in fact, they've already agreed to a different jurisdiction and the detractors refuse to simply recognize a simple contract, albeit a little bit different. And that's saying a lot. There's nothing more simple than a contract. 
There's nothing more straightforward. The first thing you learn in business law 101, and I took the class, is contract law. But they won't recognize it as a contract. They don't understand it. They've never studied it. They don't understand the, the, the finer points, the nuances. They haven't studied it. They don't know about business trust. They don't know what you've seen already in this presentation. And so what do they do? They yell and they scream and they go, oh, these things are bogus, they're illegal, they're ineffective, they're, they're null and void, and you're going to go to jail for sure if you use one. <laughs> you got to love it. I just love seeing these people blow smoke out their ears. Steam in most cases. So freedom and sovereignty, folks, is only for those who really are strong in their knowledge and understanding who can take responsibility upon themselves, make their own decisions, they can think for themselves, they're not being blown in different directions with every wind or breeze that comes along. And true sovereigns instruct their professional advisors on how to protect them. And they don't allow the tail to wag the dog. That's a true sovereign who's living free. And your education is the key and the backbone behind all that. So the question is, when would be the best time to start doing some serious business? That's a question only you can answer. But I'll give you this to think about. Would it be closer to now? Or are you going to do like most people do and say, well, maybe someday. And you know, the funny thing is, I've never been able to find maybe someday on the calendar. It's the damnedest thing. <laughs> it never shows up. So make your choice. Manage it well. Understand these issues. Put them to work for your benefit. Live a life of privacy, freedom. And this will be the end of our introductory comments. In the Law Club, we'll go into much more in-depth training, detailed relationships, business structure, contractual agreements, contingencies, all kinds of things. Uh, that's a special program that members of the Lighthouse Law Club have available to them. So if you're not a member yet, we encourage you to join, get plugged in, start using the law to your benefit. That's all for now. God bless. We'll see you in the next video.